we start in two minutes, right? Uh, okay. Shall we start, Prashanjit? Yeah, sure. Okay, so just one second. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the organizers, a very warm welcome to Professor Xavier Rosatun and all the participants of webinar and PD, webinar on PD and related areas. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Rosatan from Universitat de Barcelona, Spain. Rosatan obtained a doctorate under the guidance of Xavier Cabré from Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya, Spain in 2014. His main research areas are elliptic and parabolic PD, in particular regularity theory of integral differential equations, free boundary problems, variational problems. He has received several awards, including Premio Investigation, Investigation Scientica 2019, Antonio Valle Prize 2017. He was the youngest winner of the award ever. Del Rubio di Francia Prize 2017. He has published papers in various prestigious journals like Acta Math, Invention Math, Advances in Math, Duke, Communication, Pure Applied Mathematics, AISP Analyst, Nonlinear, Etc. At this young age, he has already uh, he has uh, he already has more than thousand citations in Math Scienet and more than two thousand in Google Scholar. He is the most cited mathematician among those who finished PhD in two thousand fourteen. He is he is in the editorial board of Nonlinear Analysis. Today he will be speaking on the Neumann, Neumann problem for the fractional Laplacian. I hope you will enjoy that talk thoroughly. For the participants, we request you to keep your questions or comments stored in the Q&A box. Xavier, it's over to you now. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much for the, for the introduction. Uh, so it's my pleasure to, to give a talk here. Uh, and so I will talk about uh, a joint work with uh, Juan Carlos Felipe Navarro and Alessandro Aldrito. So, uh, Alessandro is a postdoc in Zurich and Juan Carlos is a PhD student who's finishing this year here in Barcelona. Uh, and then uh, the title of my talk is The Neumann Problem for the Fractional Laplacian. So I will explain basically, introduce a Neumann problem for, for, the, for the operator that is the, the fractional Laplacian and then present the, the new results that concern the regularity uh, of solutions for this problem. Okay, so uh, uh, let's start with intro differential equations. So a very general motivation of why do we study this kind of equations, right? So basically, uh, it is a well-known fact that in PD is that when you consider the Brownian motion, okay, so if you study uh, from the point of view of probability, you study the Brownian motion, then you are led to second order PD. So basically, there are different considerations when studying Brownian motion or generalizations uh, that give you second order PDs, right? So basically you can obtain from probabilistic considerations, you can obtain the Dirichlet problem, the Neumann problem, the obstacle problem, you can fully nonlinear equations. There are, uh, so equations with variable coefficients. There are many different uh, motivations for, for, 
second order PDEs that come from probability, and in particular from the Brownian motion, uh, uh, from the Brownian motion itself. Okay, so, and now on the other hand, if you consider, you, you extend the concept of Brownian motion into a more general, a, a wider class of, of probabilistic or stochastic processes, then a natural class is that, that of Levy processes. Okay, so basically the Levy processes are a generalization of the Brownian motion in which you allow jumps in the process. Okay, so you consider a stochastic process uh, with possibly with jumps. Okay, and then you are led with the same considerations. So in the same way that Brownian motion gives you second order PDEs, what happens when you study Levy processes is that you obtain the same kind of equations, but now instead of differential equations, you get integral differential equations. Okay, so instead of the Dirichlet problem, the Neumann problem, the obstacle problem, fully nonlinear equations, et cetera, for the Laplacian or for second order PDEs, you get the same kind of questions, the same kind of problems, but for integral differential uh, operators. Okay, so you can, it is then natural to study the Dirichlet problem, the Neumann problem, which is the one we will see, the obstacle problem, fully nonlinear equations, et cetera. Okay, so there are uh, a variety of, of equations that are integral differential, linear or nonlinear, and that uh, come from the study of Levy processes. Okay. And Basically, the, the, the kind of operators the, that you get, so that, and that they are the, basically the analogous of the Laplacian in the second order PD case. Uh, so the Laplacian, the role of the Laplacian is played by this kind of operators, which are linear, translation invariant, meaning without X, X dependence. So there is no X dependence here on the operator and elliptic or uniform elliptic integral differential operators that are of this form. Okay, so this is the kind of operators uh, in which we are interested on. Uh, and basically it's an operator acting on say C2 functions, and then you have this principal value, and then it's an integral with a kernel that depends only on Y. Okay, and then this, uh, on, of course, this is a non-local operator because you need to know the function in all of Rn. Okay, so it's different from local PDs that for to, in order to evaluate the Laplacian at one point, you only need to know the function in a neighborhood. For these kind of operators, you need to know the function in all of Rn, okay? And if the kernel has compact support, then instead of in all of Rn, in a fixed domain sometimes, okay? Uh, then the most natural uh, class of kernels, okay, in, to, to study this are those, so the kernels are always positive or non-negative, and the most natural class of kernels is uh, the class of kernel satisfying this. So basically, this is the class that, uh, that we always study and it's kernels that are comparable to a pure power, okay? And then the power must be negative and, and of the form minus n minus two s with s between zero and one, okay? So this is the natural class of kernels. And actually when s converges to one, if you put the right constant in front, this converges to the Laplacian, okay? So this is a one parameter class of, of operators uh, that when s equals one, this converges to the Laplacian. Okay, so it's a continuous extension of, of the theory of second order PDs. Okay, and then uh, in this talk, I will assume for simplicity that the kernel is exactly this pure power with the right constant in front, so that the operator L is then the fractional Laplacian. Okay, so notice that in this case, this is clearly the simplest possible case because it's the class of operators that are scale invariant, okay? So they satisfy a scaling property in the sense that when, when you rescale the function u and you apply the operator, you just get a, a number in front, so a scaling parameter in front. Uh, so it's a scale invariant operator and it's also radially symmetric, okay? So it satisfies all the properties from the Laplacian. It's a linear operator, which is translation invariant, ellipt elliptic, a uniform elliptic, uh, and then it's also scale invariant and rotationally uh, invariant. Okay, so this operator is called the fractional Laplacian. Okay, and when S converges to one, you get exactly the Laplacian, which is the, the case of second order PDs. Okay, so this is the operator that we will consider here throughout uh, my talk, even though some of the results that I will present hold also for more general class 
uh, like this one. Okay, but I will not enter into details with this. Okay, so uh, so as I said, more general assumptions or even truncated kernels are possible in the regularity results, but I will focus on the fractional Laplacian because it's the most widely known example, and then the difficulties are basically the same. Okay, so uh, if you have questions, don't hesitate to, to ask. So you have the Q&A, and you can ask any questions you want at any time. I will be happy to stop and, and answer any questions. Okay, so uh, so once said this, let's uh, let's go to the classical, the Dirichlet, and the Neumann problems. Okay, so basically we have uh, two problems for the Laplacian that are the most natural and, and common problems, which are the Dirichlet problem and the Neumann problem, which are the, so the Dirichlet case is when you impose U is fixed on the boundary, the value of U is fixed, and the Neumann problem is when the, the normal derivative of U is fixed. Okay, so the homogeneous problems, which are the simplest ones, you can always reduce to this case, are when you fix a PDE inside the domain and the Dirichlet condition u equals zero on the boundary, while the Neumann is the normal derivative equals zero on the boundary, right? And then, basically, uh, in both cases, the, the the existence of solutions, say for the Dirichlet problem, comes from minimizing an energy function. So there is an energy functional associated to the Dirichlet problem, right? And it's this problem. So you minimize the Dirichlet energy, and then you take care of the right hand side also on the energy functional. And then when minimizing this energy functional, you get the Dirichlet problem, right? So in which sense? So more precisely, to get the Dirichlet problem, you minimize the energy function among all functions that are zero on the boundary, right? And then you get uh, the existence and uniqueness of solutions to the Dirichlet problem. This is the way to do it in the, in the classical setting of the Laplace, right? And then for the Neumann problem, basically you do the same, but you minimize the functional among all functions with no restrictions on the boundary. And if you minimize the function among all possible functions in H1, then what you get is that the minimizer, okay, that will be unique up to adding constants, the minimizer will solve the Neumann problem. Okay, so basically minimizing among all functions gives you the additional constraint, the additional uh, information that the normal derivative is zero on the boundary. Okay, so this is, the way you construct solutions to the Dirichlet problem and to the Neumann problem in the classical case. And as you see, they both come from the same energy function. The only difference is if you impose the restriction that U is zero on the boundary or if you don't. Okay. Now, what happens for the fractional Laplacian? Okay, so in case of the fractional Laplacian, then uh, basically we have something very similar. We have a Dirichlet problem. Okay, that have been, has been widely studied and is probably most uh, well known. Okay, and then let me introduce what is the Dirichlet problem and what is the energy functional associated to it. And then we will see what is a natural Neumann problem for the fractional Laplace. Okay, so basically, once we have the fractional Laplace, the Dirichlet problem is this. So the, the natural Dirichlet problem that comes from probability uh, is. Uh, basically, you consider the, the equation holds inside omega. Okay, so fractional Laplacian of u is given equal to f inside omega. And then the boundary conditions in this case turn out to be exterior conditions because you need to impose that u is zero everywhere outside omega. Okay, so u equals zero in the complement of omega. This is the natural Dirichlet problem for the fractional Laplacian. It has been studied for several decades. Uh, and then our first natural motivation comes from probability, but then there are also others. Okay, so how do we construct solutions to this problem? Well, the associated energy functional is then uh, this. So basically, this is, so if you forget about the domain of integration for a second, this is the HS norm square. Okay, so instead of the H1 norm square, which is modulus of the gradient square, in the fractional case, you consider a fractional Sobolev norm, which is the HS norm squared. Okay, so this is very natural. And then for the domain, in this case, we, we can put either, uh, so X and Y, uh, are, you could put Rn and Rn, but then because when both X and Y are outside omega, you already know what it is, you just integrate over X and Y, they are 
uh, anywhere in Rn times Rn, except for when you integrate uh, in outside omega times outside omega. Okay, so this is the really the natural uh, functional. Okay, and the same happens when you put here a different boundary condition. Instead of zero, you can put a different boundary condition, and then you you get it's the same function. You don't need to modify anything. Okay, so the Dirichlet problem for the fractional Laplacian is this. Okay, this is our energy functional. Is the HS norm with the right constant? I mean, the constant is really not important. It's just that you get exactly this operator, and then the right hand side. F is treated with this term, okay? And then what happens? Well, to, to construct solutions to the Dirichlet problem, you simply minimize the energy functional among all functions that are zero everywhere outside omega, okay? So you take the energy functional, you impose the boundary conditions, okay? You impose these boundary conditions that you know that you, they must hold, and then you minimize the functional, and it turns out you get the equation inside omega. So you get existence, uh, existence and uniqueness of the for the Dirichlet problem, okay, for the fractional Laplace. And then the regularity of solutions to the Dirichlet problem is nowadays very well understood. Uh, there are many many works, but I will refer to one uh, joint work of myself with Joachim Serra that we it was published uh, in 2014, and basically we uh, we proved the optimal Holder regularity of, of solutions plus some finer regularity that goes beyond that in terms of the distance to the boundary. Okay, so I will not enter into details. I will just say that the regularity of solutions is very well understood. And the main problem here is the boundary regularity. So in the interior, you, you don't really care about what happens with the boundary condition. So this operator is regularizing. So if F is regular enough, the U will be regular enough in the interior, right? So the main question, and, and what this paper is about is what happens near the boundary, okay? which is usually more delicate uh, <clears throat> when we study this kind of non-local operators. Okay, so this is the Dirichlet problem for the fractional Laplacian, which, as I said, is uh, more well known. And then now we wonder what is the Neumann problem for the fractional Laplacian, okay? And then I claim that the Neumann problem for the fractional Laplacian uh, or at least a very, very natural Neumann problem for the fractional Laplacian is this one, okay? And it's, you have the same equation inside omega with the same operator, fractional Laplacian of U equals F inside omega. And we get a Neumann condition that is a non-local Neumann condition, okay? So in the same way that the Dirichlet condition was non-local, it, it was prescribed everywhere outside omega. The same happens for the Neumann condition. It's a non-local condition that is prescribed everywhere outside omega. And it's this, uh, this Neumann condition, non-local Neumann condition that I call NS of U, okay? And NS of U is by definition, we will see in a second why is this the a natural Neumann problem. So this, this NS of U is given by this. So it's an integral that for every X that is outside omega, okay? So then you measure basically like the interaction between u of x, x outside, with every y that is inside. So you measure u of x minus u of y, this kind of interaction with the kernel of the fractional Laplacian between this point for every point outside, you measure the interaction with u of y for y inside omega. And then this must be zero. This is kind of non-local flux in a sense. Okay, so this is a, a, a flux that is the analog condition of saying that the normal derivative is zero, okay? But this is a non-local version of that, okay? So we will see now uh, in a minute some properties of, of this non-local normal Neumann derivative or Neumann condition, okay? But I wanted to write it down first so that you, you have it here. And then uh, it's an interaction between the inside for every X, U of X minus the inter this integral of U of Y must be zero, okay? And this is a non-local normal derivative. And we studied this problem first uh, in a joint work with Serena Di Pierro and Enrique, Enrique Baldinocci. Enrique Baldinocci, uh, in 2000, it was published in 2017. And also it was studied before that uh, by Du, Gunzburger, uh, Lehuk, and Zhu, okay, in, in CM Review in 2013. Okay, so there are, and after our paper and, and their paper, there are also other works uh, that study this problem. 
Okay, so uh, as, as I will see, as we will see in a second, uh, I claim that this is a very natural Neumann problem. Okay, so why is that? Because uh, so you will see that we have some basic properties that that are very natural, and the first one from the motivation that I said before in terms of the energy functional. Well, it turns out that solutions to this Neumann problem are obtained by minimizing exactly the same energy functional as the Dirichlet problem. Okay, so you take the energy function of the Dirichlet problem and you minimize it among all functions, okay, with no boundary conditions, say, and, and then uh, if you minimize the functional among all possible functions, okay, with no conditions, then you get the Neumann problem. So this is exactly what happens for the Laplacian, right? You take the same functional for the Dirichlet problem, but you take out the Dirichlet conditions in the minimization, then you get the Neumann problem. Well, here is the same. You get the same functional. You don't uh, impose that U is zero outside. You just minimize, and then you get existence and uniqueness up to adding constants of a solution. Okay, and this solution solves exactly the Neumann problem that I presented uh, right uh, in the previous slide. Okay, so this is a first and very natural uh, property of, of this Neumann problem. So the existence and, and uniqueness of solutions follows uh, from the same energy functional as the one of Dirichlet. Then another interesting property, which is very related to this actually, of course, is that we have an integration by parts formula. Okay, so this is saying that if you integrate in omega the fractional Laplacian of u, okay, then in, in the classical case, you get by the divergence theorem, you get uh, the integral on the boundary of the flux of the of the normal condition of the normal derivative, right? And then the 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 normal derivative is a kind of flux, is telling you how much mass or how much is entering the, the domain, basically. If you think on a parabolic problem, well, here it's the same. Okay, so if you integrate in omega the fractional Laplacian, you get an integral outside omega of this non-local normal derivative. Okay, so so this Neumann condition, uh, this Neumann condition uh, is uh, appearing in in this kind of divergence type theorem. Okay, so there is a question that says, what is the space of minimization HS of Rn or HS of omega? Well, the space of minimization is actually uh, the space of functions for which this is finite. Uh, so you can you can take HS of Rn, I think, but um, no, I think you have to take exactly this, this function. So this, this function space. Okay, so this is something in between, in a sense, uh, between the HS of omega and HS of Rn. You take exactly this as a, as a function space and, and you minimize the energy function. Okay. Uh, then another nice and interesting property is that this integration by parts formula can be extended in a slightly more general setting. So you have not only this kind of divergence type theorem, but a more general one that in the classical case, this would be saying like the gradient gradient. So the, the, the integral of gradient U gradient V is equal to V times the Laplacian plus the boundary term. Well, here we have something like that also. Okay, and the gradient gradient, it's a bilinear form. Okay, which is this one, it's the one corresponding, the bilinear form corresponding to this energy functional. And then you get the V times the fractional Laplacian of U plus a boundary term in which this normal, kind of non local normal derivative appears. Okay, then the problem also has, so related to what I said at the beginning, that we are interested in the, the probabilistic interpretation. This problem has a natural probabilistic interpretation that has been studied. So we, we provided in our paper with Serena Di Piero and Enrico Baldinocci, we provided a, a heuristic probabilistic interpretation, and this has been later uh, more studied by, well, studied by probabilists. Okay, so there is a natural probabilistic interpretation, which is very related to the Levy process corresponding to the fractional Laplacian. Moreover, if you consider the, the corresponding heat equation, okay, so the parabolic equation for the fractional Laplacian, uh, with norm, with this Neumann problem, okay, with Neumann boundary conditions, then you get that you have conservation of mass. Okay, so this is what you expect from a Neumann problem. Okay, and this is the only way that if you have the fractional Laplacian and, and it's the heat equation corresponding to the fractional Laplacian, if you want to have conservation of mass, then you need this kind of identity. And this is only true for this 
uh, non-local Neumann condition. Okay, and then we get convergence also when s converges to one, you get the classical Neumann problem. Okay, so I hope that with all these properties, you see that this is a, the, the basically a very, very natural Neumann problem for the fractional Laplacian operator. Okay, uh, so there are also, I have to say, there are also other Neumann problems that people have studied. I will focus on this one also only. Okay, so because of these properties, I think this is a very, very natural Neumann problem. In other contexts, it might uh, be more natural to study another uh, different Neumann problem. Okay, but I will not enter into, into this. Okay, so let's now turn on the regularity of solutions, which is what uh, we are most interested on. Uh, we want to understand first, so let me briefly explain what is the regularity of solutions for the Dirichlet problem. Okay, so the Dirichlet problem for the fractional Laplacian is this one, and then, well, we have an explicit solution. Okay, so this is the first way to see what is the, you, what is the regularity that you expect. Well, the explicit solution you get in this case, so you've set f being one, okay, and omega being the ball. And then the problem is this. In Rn, you get in the ball, you get the equation fractional Laplacian equals one, outside the unit ball, you get u equals zero. Okay, and then the explicit solution is, with the right, the right constant in front is u minus x squared and then raised to the power s. So the power s is exactly the power from the fractional Laplacian here. Now, what happens to this solution? Well, in the interior, u is infinity. Okay, so we know this, we already knew this by interior regularity. This is easy to, to see basically. And of course, this, uh, this explicit solution satisfies what we knew. That is that u is infinity inside but what happens near the boundary? Well, near the boundary, this function is not even Lipschitz. So the derivative of this is not even bounded. Okay, so the derivative of this function is, is, is unbounded and the function is only Cs up to the boundary. Okay, where S is a number between zero and one. Okay, so it's Helder continuous up to the boundary, uh, which is nice. So it's Helder continuous, but not Lipschitz continuous. And the optimal regularity is C0 alpha for alpha equals S. Okay, and so basically C infinity inside and C S up to the boundary. So this notation, I mean C0 comma S. Okay, but for simplicity, I denote it like this. C S up to the boundary, where S is this number between zero and one that comes from the exponent. And this is optimal. So nothing better can be proved. Okay, and well, it turns out that the same happens for every domain that is C2 or C11 or even C1 alpha, and F is in L infinity, say. Then what we proved was that uh, in, in the general case, every solution U is Cs up to the boundary. And moreover, actually, if you divide U by divided by distance to the S, is also Helder continues up to the boundary. Okay, so I, this is something that was more delicate to prove, but. Uh, I don't want to enter into these kind of details because the, the important thing for me here in this talk is that in the Dirichlet problem, you get that U is CS and that this is optimal. Okay, so there are a couple of questions that let me let me reply to these questions. So the first one says, your non-local Neumann problem is interpreted in terms of a variational solution. Can we also make sense of the solution in the viscosity sense? Okay, so this is a good question. And and I think the answer should be yes, but I, we didn't really work on this. So, so that would be interesting. I, I, don't, I don't think there is any paper trying to, to, to study this problem in the viscosity sense, but I think it should be possible, definitely. So it should be possible to give a solution, uh, to construct solutions in the viscosity sense, but this has not been done so far. Uh, and then there is another question. How does the domain of integration and integrand changes as we move from Neumann to mixed boundary condition? Can you give some probabilistic interpretation of mixed boundary condition? So the answer is yes. So basically, if you want some mixed boundary condition between uh, Dirichlet and Neumann, you, you would find this in our paper, uh, in the first paper with Serena Di Piero and Enrico Valdinocci, in which we discussed exactly this, what happens with mixed boundary conditions this is also possible. Uh, and basically the energy functional is the same, it doesn't change. Okay, so, but, uh, and the probabilistic interpretation basically 
uh, in the Dirichlet case, it means that if you think on the Laplacian, for the, for the fractional Laplacian is the same. Uh, so basically, the Dirichlet problem means that when the if you think on a, of a particle randomly moving inside a domain, when the Dirichlet case corresponds to when the particle goes outside, it's killed, okay, and then everything stops. While the Neumann problem is kind of you go back inside, so it's it's a um, basically there's a kind of reflection that makes you go once you go outside. The Neumann problem tells you that you go back inside, so that's why there is conservation of mass. Okay, and then for the mixed boundary condition, basically when the particle goes outside, then there is a probability that dies and then it's killed, and there's a, prob a certain probability that it goes back inside, and this is what gives you mixed boundary conditions. Okay, and then there is another question: Is there an explicit solution known in the fractional P Laplacian case uh, in case of a ball? Well, I'm not sure. I don't know. Sorry. Uh, I think solutions still look like C. S, like distance to the S. So I would guess that there are some explicit solutions, but I don't know if in the case of the ball or only, for example, on a half line in dimension one, I'm not sure. Okay, so I hope I answered the questions. Otherwise, let me know and I'll be happy to give more details. Okay. Uh, so this is what happens for the Dirichlet problem. And now, so the, what you should keep in mind is that for the Dirichlet problem, solutions are CS, and this is optimal. And this, you can see it already with an explicit solution. Okay. Now, what happens for the Neumann problem? Well, uh, if you consider the Neumann problem, things are not so easy, turns out. So already for the Dirichlet problem, the, the regularity theorem that I presented in the, in the previous slide, so this regularity theorem was quite challenging because the tools that you use for the Laplacian, for the classical second order PDEs, which is basically you can flatten the boundary and do an odd reflection. Okay. And then the problem basically becomes kind of a interior regularity problem. This is what you can do for the Dirichlet problem, right? Uh, in case of the Laplacian. Well, it turns out for the fractional Laplacian, because the equation is non local, you cannot do that. This is why this is more challenging. And you need to do everything with barriers, with explicit super solutions and subsolutions and so on. And then this is where you use these explicit uh, barriers, okay? So for the Neumann problem, things are more delicate because the, the this kind of reflection that you use for the Laplacian, it doesn't work either. And then uh, and then the, the strategy that we use for the Dirichlet case, it doesn't work as well, okay? So this is a, a new problem in a sense, it's, it's different from, from the previous, uh, results from the previous proofs that we had. Okay, so basically what we know, what we knew uh, before our results uh, is the following. So basically inside omega solutions are smooth. There is no problem with that because it's still the same equation. So the fractional Laplacian has a regularization property. So solutions are smooth inside. Uh, but however, even after our first paper with Serena de Piero and Enrico Baldinocci and other works, uh, there's, there was this question that uh, remained open for several years. I mean, since 2015 or 16 that we introduced the, the problem till now that said, uh, well, basically it was not even known that solutions are bounded and continuous on the boundary. Okay, so are solutions continuous up to the boundary for this Neumann problem? Okay, and even this basic question remained uh, open and seemed uh, challenging. Okay, and then the second question is, well, are they C alpha? Are they Helder continuous up to the boundary? And then if so, what is the optimal alpha? So I would expect a priori, if you have a natural Neumann problem like this, you would expect solutions to be also Helder continuous. Okay, and then uh, moreover, not only Helder continuous, but the natural question is, okay, what is the optimal alpha? Okay, so in the Dirichlet case, what we saw is that solutions are indeed Helder continues and the optimal alpha is S. So solutions are CS up to the boundary and this is optimal. Well, can we have a similar result in this context? Can we have a similar uh, theorem for the Neumann problem? Okay, so this, is, this was the main motivation for our new work. Uh, and, and then the, the problem here is that several difficulties arise. So basically we have no explicit solution to this problem even if you are in dimension one. So even in dimension one, there is no explicit solution to the Neumann problem that is really a minimizing 
uh, the energy functional for the Neumann problem. Okay, so we have no explicit solution to work with. So I don't even know what to expect. What, what is the optimal alpha that you expect? In the Dirichlet case, as long as you construct an explicit solution in 1D, you see what is the optimal alpha or what, what you expect it to be, right? Here, we don't know. And then uh, classical methods do not work in the sense that basically for the Laplacian, what you do is flattening the boundary and do an even reflection, right? Because then if you have an harmonic function uh, with Neumann boundary condition on a flat domain, you do the, the reflection, the even reflection will be harmonic function in the full ball, right? And then you just apply interior regularity. This is something that you can do in case of the Laplacian, but this is something you cannot do in case of the fractional Laplacian. So this doesn't work completely place. Okay, so we can forget about doing something like that. Uh, and then the methods from the Dirichlet case do not work either because they are based on barriers. So because you know that u is zero outside the boundary, then if the domain is nice enough, then you can construct explicit barriers like uh, in a ball or out in the complement of a ball that uh, imply that your solution is controlled by the distance to the S. And then from this, you work out uh, the regularity and prove that the solutions are CS up to the boundary, right? So this is something that does not work either for the Neumann problem, right? Because U is not fixed outside omega. I only know this Neumann condition, but this is only a relation between u inside and outside, but it does not tell me what is the regularity near the boundary because uh, so basically in the Dirichlet problem, you know the regularity outside because u is zero, so it's completely regular. And then you need to see how from the inside, how the solution approaches. In the Neumann problem, you don't know how it behaves from the inside or from the outside. So you cannot really use any kind of barrier here, okay? So these are the difficulties that we have when studying the Neumann problem. And now uh, we can now answer uh, these questions. So basically, in, this is the joint work with Alessandro Ditro uh, and Juan Carlos Felipe and myself that it's a preprint that we finished this year. And our main result says the following. So basically, if omega is a C1 domain and F is, say, bounded, okay? Uh, then solutions are bounded, are continuous, and moreover, they are C alpha for a small alpha positive. Okay, so there exists a, a, a universal number that the alpha that depends only on N and S. It's kind of explicit, but it's a tiny number, okay, for which solutions are C alpha uh, uniformly up to the boundary. Okay, so this answers the, the question of Solutions are, are bounded, yes. Solutions are continuous, yes. Solutions are Helder continuous, yes. Okay, and now it remains only to answer the question of can you say what is the optimal alpha? And then this turns out to be very delicate in the Neumann problem and we cannot answer, but we can say something more in case of S bigger than one half. So what we can say in case S bigger than one half is that this alpha can be improved to a number that is two S minus one plus alpha. Okay, when S is bigger than one half, the exponent we can put here is better than two S minus one. Okay, so this is the best we can say. And actually we can prove the same for F not only being L infinity, but being simply LQ for Q bigger than N. Okay, so this is our main result that we prove in this preprint with uh, uh, Alessandro and Juan Carlos. And, and it concerns the, the regularity up to the boundary for solutions to the Neumann problem. Okay, so uh, there is a question that says, I think in the Dirichlet case, you also use Harnack inequality. Does it work here? Okay, this is a good question. So I will talk about that in a, in a second. So I will talk about that in a, in a second in the proof uh, when I discuss the proof of this. Okay, so I will answer in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, so basically, this is our main result, and it says that solutions are C alpha, and moreover, than when S is bigger than one half, solutions are better than that and are 2S minus one plus alpha. It remains an open problem to decide what is the optimal regularity. Okay, so I don't really have a guess. Uh, I would, well, my guess is that they are better than that, uh, but it's not clear, for example, are they C 2S? I mean, it's not clear, if, even if F is C infinity, because we don't have explicit solutions, it's not clear how much regular should solutions be? Okay, so this uh, 
this is an open problem. Okay, but the, the important thing is that now we have the, the regularity up to the boundary, the Hilbert regularity up to the boundary, and, and the improved regularity in case of S is bigger than one half. So let's discuss a bit the, the, the proof and let's give some comments about it. So basically, just to recall, uh, this is the first regularity result uh, on the boundary for the Neumann problem. Even the continuity of solutions was new. So there is a, a, another preprint that was at the same time of ours, a, a week before, in which of uh, Serena Di Piero and Enrico Valdinocci. I don't remember if there were other authors, I'm sorry. Uh, but in which they proved, they studied eigenfunctions for the, so the Neumann eigenfunctions for the fractional Laplacian. And in a general setting, they also proved the boundedness of, of solutions. Okay, so boundedness was established at the same time uh, of ours uh, in another paper that had a uh, different perspective. So basically the boundedness in our case and in their case, I think it was not the main result. So the, the difficulty was what really challenging here, okay? Uh, and then, well, it turns out that the same as in the Dirichlet problem, as, uh, same that happened in the Dirichlet problem, turns out that the boundary regularity is much more delicate than in the interior. Okay, we will see that in a second. And to prove the result, we need a delicate Moser iteration on the boundary involving some logarithmic corrections. We will see in a second what I mean by that. Okay, and then uh, another comment that it's really not obvious from the statement or anything like that is that this exponent 2s minus 1 is somehow critical for this problem. Okay, so if you're interested, you can look at uh, our paper and the introduction. So I will not explain more than that, but it, you need to know that 2s minus 1 is somehow critical. And then it's good that we can pass from this exponent in the regularity, okay? Because 2s minus 1, there is a kind of a fake solution that appears, which is not really a solution. Uh, and then it's good that we can pass from this critical exponent in any case, okay? And then, as I said, it's not clear what is the optimal regularity. And basically, what our methods yield is that if you can do this in 1D, if, if you can prove a regularity result in 1D, then we can do it in every C1 domain of a red. Okay, this is what, uh, thanks to our results, uh, we can do with this. Okay, so this is also an important point here that if you can do the optimal regularity in dimension one, then you take our paper and everything works in dimension n. Okay, so for the C alpha estimate up to the boundary, and now I will answer the, the question. Uh, so for the C alpha estimate up to the boundary, in the Dirichlet problem, the paper that I mentioned, 2014, our idea was to use idea was to use tools from the boundary regularity theory for non-divergence form elliptic equations, like second order elliptic equations in non-divergence form. Okay, and more precisely, we used a boundary Harnack kind of Harnack inequality approach. Okay, so we used the Harnack inequality and then we proved a boundary Harnack inequality for the Dirichlet problem. Okay, so Harnack inequality is on the boundary, and then this whole this this is proved by constructing explicit barriers, okay, sub super solutions, and then you end up proving a boundary Harnack inequality. This is what we did in the Dirichlet problem. So this does not work in the in the in the Neumann case. Okay, so this is basically uh, the answer to the question. No, this does not work in the Neumann case, and you need to do something different. And what we do is something uh, quite interesting, I think, which is to use ideas from the interior regularity theory for divergence form elliptic equations. So for the Dirichlet, we needed to use the ideas from the boundary regularity theory for non-divergence. Well, for the Neumann, we need to use ideas from the interior regularity theory for divergence form. Okay, so it's completely uh, different. And more precisely uh, is the Moser iteration that I said at the beginning. So it's also interesting to say that this kind of, a, this approach that we do, it does not work, or at least we do not, know how to make it work with the original formulation of the problem. Okay, so you take the problem uh, that I, in the way I stated it, and then uh, saying fractional Laplacian inside with the Neumann condition outside, and then it's very difficult or we cannot make it work to, to do a kind of treat it as an interior regularity result. Okay, so interior regularity um, approach. Okay, but if we transform the problem, so if you remember, Basically, so let me, before saying this, if you remember the Neumann condition was basically relating u of x outside with u of y inside, right? So basically we say, okay, let's take u of x outside is given 
by the values of u inside. This follows from the Neumann condition. Basically, u of x outside is prescribed at any point once you know the u inside. Okay, so u of x is prescribed in terms of the u inside. And now the fractional Laplacian, the equation, it's an integral in all of our n. But now use that outside, you know what is u of x in terms of the u inside. So basically, you put back everything inside. And then you, you, we write our equation in terms of a new equation, which only happens inside the domain. Okay, so we transform the problem into something that happened in which everything happens inside the domain. And then you get an equation inside the domain, okay, with no conditions outside. And then we can prove that this is an explicit kernel, but very strange in a sense. And then we can prove that if omega is Lipschitz, we prove some estimates for which the new kernel we get is comparable to something, well, to exactly this. So one plus the negative part of the logarithm of the minimum of the distance between distance of x, distance of y, divided by x minus y. Okay, so you take the negative part of the logarithm of this, divided by the kernel of the fractional Laplacian, and then characteristic uh, function of x and y. Okay, so this is the kind of new kernel that arises in our in this setting. Okay, and now we have transformed our equation that had interior and exterior in an, in a new equation that has only interior. Okay, with no boundary conditions, and then you get kind of a Neumann problem for this weird operator, but this is better for our approach to treat it as an interior regularity, in a sense. Okay, so we now take this kernel, and then we need to uh, a Moser iteration uh, on the boundary in which you get these logarithmic corrections that mm, everything is a bit messed up uh, because of this logarithm. Okay, so basically you have a logarithmic singularity near the boundary, but anyway, we managed to do everything uh, with the logarithmic corrections to get at the end that the C alpha norm of U up to the boundary is bounded by say the LT norm, L2 norm of U and the LQ norm of F. Okay, and this is thanks to our uh, Moser iteration with this uh, logarithmic corrections that you have here. Okay. So, so this is the idea of the C alpha estimate up to the boundary. So basically, if you know uh, what is the regional fractional Laplacian or sensor process, uh, basically we have transformed our Neumann problem into a regional kind of problem with a logarithmic term here. Okay, but otherwise you can forget about what I said now. Uh, and basically then once we have this C alpha estimate up to the boundary, how do we prove the, the higher order estimate? Well. We also develop all tools that we need in order to get higher regularity results. Okay, which is basically thanks to the C alpha estimate, we have compactness. Okay, you really need a C alpha estimate in order to do any blow up or any compactness argument because you need this, this um, uniform bound in C alpha in order to get compactness by Arzelas Colley. So that basically, uh, we use a blow up and compactness argument based on a on the, my paper with uh, Joachim Serra in 2016, in which we studied higher order regularity, higher order boundary regularity for the Dirichlet case. And using this approach, thanks to the C alpha estimate, what we managed to prove is that if S is bigger than one half and omega is C1, then we get this higher order regularity. Okay, so higher in, in terms of 2S minus 1 plus alpha for some alpha positive. Okay, and then Basically, this exponent, as I said, is somehow critical, but I, I already said this. The, the question is like, well, what is the exponent we can put here? Well, if you can prove a Liouville theorem in dimension one of this form, okay? So if you want to, what we need in order to prove this is this kind of Liouville theorem with beta exactly this number. And this is something challenging that we do, that we prove, basically, that we prove that this Liouville theorem that you have the fractional Laplacian in a half line equals zero, the equation on a half line equals zero, the Neumann condition uh, on, a half, on the other half line being zero, plus the, U, the function u has some growth, say x to the beta, okay, in R, in dimension one. So the, I wanted to emphasize that this is dimension one. If you have this, if you, if you can prove that this implies that u is constant in dimension one, then 
uh, you get the C beta, thanks to our methods, this blow up and compactness argument, you would get a C beta regularity here. Okay, so if you can prove this with the beta, then you can put this with the beta. And then what we do is we actually prove this with this exponent 2s minus 1 plus alpha here. Okay, and the open question that remains open is this like the, the last open question that remains open is well, what is the best beta that you can put here in dimension one? Because then once you do this, you get uh, a better regularity. So uh, there is a question by uh, that says that this Liouville theorem probably leads to almost optimal regularity. Yes, well, depends on, yes, we don't know what is the optimal regularity. What I, what I claim is that. Uh, if you can prove this theorem with a beta, then you can put a beta here, right? So, and then uh, the question is right. Um, basically, if there was a solution that was behaving like beta, then the theorem would be false, right? So basically, if you expect that there is a certain number, say 2s, imagine that it was 2s, I don't know, uh, then in, for which there is a solution to this, then you cannot prove the theorem with 2s. So at most, what this little theorem can get you is a almost optimal regularity. So it would, you would expect to get 2s minus epsilon for every epsilon, something like that. But uh, we are far from that. So we don't know what is the optimal regularity. We don't expect. And then if you can prove this, uh, then, well, you, you get a better regularity here. So if anyone knows how to prove this, I'll be happy to, to know how to do that. Uh, and then finally, one last comment, which is uh, in a setting that is slightly simpler from the reality point of view, at least in our paper, but it's almost as difficult as. So it's almost, uh, it's so much related at the end that it's, it's, it's very similar, but it's slightly simpler. Okay, so a different Neumann problem, okay, is the one that you obtain by minimizing in really HS of omega. Okay, so if you minimize, the, the, the energy you consider this tilde energy, okay, which is the double integral is only omega times omega. So from the beginning, you impose that everything happens only inside omega. Okay, this is a different problem with a different operator that is called sometimes the regional fractional Laplacian. Okay, so we see from the beginning nothing outside omega. Okay, and then the operator is a kind of fractional Laplacian in which you integrate only an omega. Okay, so this is not anymore really translation invariant, for example, because you really see the domain. It's not really rotation invariant because the domain is in general has a different form, but it's a natural operator that has been widely studied also in probability uh, and in PDEs. So this is also a very nice operator for which uh, the, the, the same problem was open basically. Okay, so, uh, Basically, the same question can be asked in this in this context, and is well, if you consider the Neumann problem for this regional fractional Laplacian, which is you minimize this energy functional, can you prove regularity? Okay, and then the difficulties were basically the same, and and the answer was well, the problem was completely open, and then what we what we have is that we can also prove the same result, the same theorem with the same exponents for this Neumann problem too. Okay, and then uh, uh, the problem also has a probabilistic interpretation, conservation of mass for the heat equation, and convergence as s goes to one to the classical Neumann problem. Okay, so this is also a different Neumann problem that is natural. Okay, so the difference for me is that the operator really that appears inside omega is not translation invariant, is not rotation invariant. So it's really not a Levy process, but it's still a stochastic process that is very natural. Okay, so. Uh, this is a, 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 a different uh, problem. And then because of the way we prove our result, we can prove the same for this case too. So basically the only difference is that, so if you remember uh, when I went here, so basically the region of fractional Laplacian is you forget about the logarithm here, okay? You remove the logarithm and then this is the region of fractional Laplacian that we have here. And this is why, we can prove the same result, okay? So basically it's a bit easier for us to prove it because there is no logarithmic corrections. It's a slightly easier, but this is almost as difficult, okay? And then I want to mention also that in this problem, there is a nice paper that is more recent. Uh, it, it came out just a week after or two 
after our result by Mustafa Fall, uh, also 2020, that in this case, so this is something, uh, a very smart idea that works only for the regional, not for the other one, okay? But in this case, uh, he can prove a better 1D Liouville theorem, okay? And then in, in, in the regional fractional Laplacian, he can prove that in this case, you get C, two S minus epsilon for every epsilon, okay? So this is an improved regularity. And, and this is nice because in this case, he's able, able to use, uh, so to transform this exact problem in dimension one using the extension into a fractional Laplacian with a hardy potential. Okay, so, so this is, and then it, in a Dirichlet problem. Okay, so this is a very strange transformation, but this, it's very nice. And then this allows him to prove C two S minus epsilon regularity in this case. And then this makes us wonder if the same regularity would be true for the for the problem that I was presenting for the Neumann problem for the fractional Laplacian, and this is not known. Okay, so this would be very nice to to get. Okay, so uh, I will stop here and thank you very much for for your attention. Thank you very much, Javier, for such a wonderful talk. Uh, I will invite uh, questions and comments from the participants. So if participants, if you have any comments or questions, please type it in the Q&A box. Uh, the Neumann condition for the region of fractional Laplacian is not. Yes, exactly. That, that was a, that's an, a, an interesting question, a good question. Uh, so in this case, there is no, there, there was no, Neumann condition in a sense. So there is no way to write the Neumann condition because uh, you need some regularity in a sense to expect. So for example, if this is the, the Neumann condition here is local, it's really on the boundary, right? So it's like in the Laplacian, when you when you prove the, the one for the Laplacian, you get that the normal derivative is zero, right? So it has a kind of normal derivative equal to zero. Uh, here, but, but in order to, to say that, you need to know that solutions are C1 up to the boundary in order to state what is the Neumann condition for the Laplacian. Here is the same. So here, now that we know the regularity, we can say that the Neumann condition here is basically that a kind of, it's a, on the boundary, but it's a kind of non-local normal derivative is zero. Is that U divided by distance to the two S minus one is zero. Okay, so that U vanishes more than distance to the two S minus one. This is why the, the, this exponent two S minus one is somehow critical in this problem. It's what distinguishes solution to the Dirichlet problem from the Neumann problem in the regional case. Okay, so in the regional case, uh, in this case, solutions are for the Dirichlet problem, they look like two S, distance to the two S minus one. This is the exact power in, for which, uh, in which they behave near the boundary and solutions to the Neumann problem are the ones for which this, this kind of non normal uh, derivative is zero. So, but it's a local condition on the boundary. Yeah. So thank you for all the questions. I don't know if there are more, but I'll be happy to answer any other questions. Hello, sir. Uh, Hello. Can I ask yeah, so yeah, sure. I have a question. So you assumed the boundary of the domain to be uh, C1. Is there scope for improvement to that condition? Okay, that's a good question as well. Uh, so basically, so let me go to the theorem here. Uh, so basically here I was saying that uh, omega is C1 in this theorem. So if you think, uh, so for Lipschitz domains, I do not expect, so if you go below Lipschitz, uh, below C1, which is Lipschitz, I think I do not expect solutions to be uh, this regular. So in Lipschitz domains, we can prove this. Actually, I, I didn't separate into two, but this first part holds for any Lipschitz domain. And this second part, we need the C1. Okay, so, and why do we need the C1 here? Because this part is really with a Moser iteration and then uh, it's very explicit in a sense, we construct everything and then it works in Lipschitz domains. But then this second part is with a blow up argument, right? So we need the domain to be C1 so that in the limit you get a flat space, right? So in the compactness and blow up, 
if your domain was Lipschitz and you do a blow up, you still get a Lipschitz domain. But if the domain was C1 and you do a blow up, in the limit, it's flat. So this is a big difference between C1 and Lipschitz domains. OK, so for Lipschitz domains, I would not expect this in general. So not, notice that if I formally I put S equal 1, here I'm saying that solutions are C1 alpha, C1 alpha up to the boundary. OK, and, and I think in the local case, you need the domain to be C1 for this to be true. Otherwise, it's I don't. Well, I'm not sure. OK, but but maybe uh, you need the domain to be C1. OK, so my guess would be this holds in Lipschitz domains. And this is uh, the best we can get. But this for this, you really need C1. And then if you get usually once you get you want to get higher and higher regularity, you, you need the domain to be better and better. So uh, another question, is there any role of linearity of the operator? If yes, can you please highlight where it is used? Uh, not really, there is, we don't use that much that the operator is, is linear. So, well, uh, so in the Moser iteration, this usually works with equations with bounded measurable coefficients, say in the, in the local case for the Laplacian. So basically, if you change this operator to an operator that has uh, is like uniform elliptic in divergence form, not local, with bounded measurable coefficients, I would expect uh, the result this C alpha regularity to still hold. Uh, while in here, you really need the one D Liouville theorem, and then this is a bit more more delicate. I mean, it, this is really a one D argument that we use much more. What is the operator in dimension one? And we need some something more. Okay, so I would expect that this is very general, and then it might work with nonlinear operators. This is a bit more delicate, so uh, you need to use much more precisely what is the particular operator you have. So I have a very naive question. So is there mm -hmm. any connection uh, between this uh, Neumann problem and Martin kernel? And I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, I do not know. Is there any connection? Uh, uh, no, I, I don't think so, but I'm not sure. I mean, because then sometimes there are unexpected connections in these kind of problems. Uh, so no, I, I don't think so, honestly, but uh, okay. because, so if the Martin, so you mean so these kind of solutions that are blow up near the boundary? Mm -hmm. So, so there are other solutions indeed that are solutions to the fractional Laplacian, but then you can put zero outside plus some boundary condition, generalized boundary condition that you prescribe what is the singularity of solution near the boundary. This is the Martin kernel mm -hmm. solutions. And they, are, they seem to be quite independent. So it's a kind of parallel theory. And then it, I don't see any relation. So what is true is that with this kind of solutions, uh, there is, the papers of Jer Group, uh, she proved that there is a Neumann problem also for this Martin kernel kind of solutions, which is completely different from this one and is unrelated. Okay, but there is a, from this point of view, there is a Neumann problem for, for these Martin kernel conditions that are solutions that are very singular near the boundary, but they solve a kind of Neumann condition on the boundary. Okay. The paper, you mentioned which paper? paper uh, I didn't follow the paper. Group. Jer, Jer group. Okay. And I, I can I can send it to you by email if you want. I can yeah, I can sure. send you the paper. Yeah, I can send you the paper. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Yep. So for the regional fraction, do you have integration by parts? My man. Um, Yes, that's also a good question. So you can, if you have the regional fractional Laplacian, uh, then the integration by parts is it exists, but you need to assume some regularity, okay, of the of the function that is, and I believe that the regularity that we prove or that uh, Mustafa Fall proves in his paper should is should be enough in order to prove the integration by parts. The integration by parts is integral inside the domain of this operator 
is equal to an integral on the boundary, on the boundary only of the u divided by distance to the 2s minus 1. Okay, so it's a kind of non normal derivative, but it's local, it's on the boundary. Okay, so it's more similar to the Pogosaev identities that uh, we proved with Joachim Serra for the Dirichlet case, in a sense. So for the regional fractional ablation, there is an integration by parts identity like this. You can find it in the uh, in in our paper with we the paper that I'm talking about with Alessandro Drito and Juan Carlos Navarro. We we write it down and we give the reference. So there is a integration by parts for the regional fractional Laplacian. Yes. Thank you. But it's local. Sir, uh, for the uh, Neumann problem, you uh, the boundary operator, I'm a little bit concerned about, uh, like naively, it seems like that uh, the both the fractional Laplacian and the boundary operator NS that is uh, something, yes, that is like fractional Laplacian itself. And that looks. Like... Yes, it looks similar, but yeah, but it's really not because X is far from omega, yeah. say. Yes. So it really, if omega is in one place and X is in the other, it's really, th there is no need for principal value or anything like that here. Yes. But yes, so... I agree. It, yeah, it looks like yeah. fractional Laplacian. Yes. They, they look similar. So if uh, formally we just think we are putting s equal to one in the problem so it it turns out to be laplacian of u equals f and laplacian of u equals zero in the complement so it would have been uh, easier for me to understand if there uh, it's uh, like n s by two u equals zero so okay but so what you say about the limit when s goes to one this is not really true because you don't get the Laplacian. Okay, so this is something delicate and it, it's not obvious, but we prove that this problem converges to the Neumann problem for the fractional Laplacian when S goes to one, and this operator converges to the normal derivative. Okay, so basically, uh, basically, if you think about S equal one, you need to put a constant here, okay, that goes to zero, right? When S goes to one, this is something you do. And now if X, goes to, so X is a point outside Omega. Uh, this is not singular. This, this is really something that uh, this integral X is far from Y always. So this is never singular. For every X is fixed. Mm -hmm. So X is fixed and Y is inside Omega and X is outside Omega. So they are far from each other. Mm -hmm. So this is not really singular. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you put the right constant and you make for every fixed x outside, this condition simply goes to zero, nothing. Zero equals zero. That is, it gives you nothing. Okay, so so it's not really a, even if it looks similar, it's not really a fractional Laplacian. It's you can even write the u of x outside the integral. You can write it as u of x equal to uh, an integral inside omega of u of one. Yes. So. So it's a bit it's a bit different. Okay. And then it only mean it only uh, in the limit this condition it's only meaningful when x is very 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 close to the boundary and when as x is go going to the boundary in the limit you get only a condition on the boundary. This is uh, so it's a bit delicate to see that, but but you can you can see that in our first paper with uh, Baldino, uh, Serena Di Piero and Enrico Baldinocci, and and then we proved uh, that this was. This is what happens. So is there any more uh, comments or questions? So if not, uh, yes. So if there is no more uh, comments or questions, we thank Javier once again for such a wonderful talk and making our session successful uh, for uh, by accepting the invitation. We hope to get your participation in future talks as well. So for the, <clears throat> for the participants, the announcement will meet on Thursday for the talk of Professor Giampiero Pellatucci on uh, Helder, inequal Helder regularity for non-local double phase equations. Now I request all the participants to leave the platform. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Xavier. Thank you very much.
Thank you. And bye bye. See you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, questions can I give you?